Hiromini and Rack by G. Bramwell Evans Give me the clear blue sky over my head and the green turf beneath my feet, a winding road before me, and then to thinking. Chapter 4 Nature's Safeguards, April We met John Fell the gamekeeper on the fringe of the wood. He was carrying a small spade. His gun rested over his shoulder whilst on his back was slung a bag in which were a couple of small rabbit nets. In another small bag of canvas was a ferret, whose frequent scratchings showed it wished to be free. Just getting a few odd rabbits that are damaging some young trees, John said by way of explanation, for he knew I hated a gun. Rack and I joined him, and we walked along with our eyes open for likely burrows. There's a likely one here, I said, stopping in front of one. John looked at it for a moment, shook his head, and passed on. What's wrong with it? I asked, just a trifle annoyed that he had given it such scanty attention. The veil's on it, he answered, and seeing that I did not understand what he meant, turned back and we viewed the hole together. Look carefully, he said. Then I saw that some tiny spider had stretched three silken tight ropes across the entrance. From a certain angle they glistened with the night's frost. No need to try any burrow when that little curtain is there, said the keeper. Save a cap of time and trouble if you keep your eyes skinned. Further on, Rax stood before a similar entrance. There's a rabbit in there, I said decisively. Sure, asked my companion. Dead sure, I answered. And as John forbore to ask how I knew, I proceeded to tell him. When Rack finds a hole, he always smells at it. If it's empty, he gives one sniff and turns away, though his tail works on as usual. But if there's a rabbit in it, he gives a second long indrawn smell, and for a moment that wagging pendulum stands out straight in a line from his back, stiff as a poker. Then it nearly wags itself off his body. Look at it now. We'll prove it, said John, and as I called the dog off, he put the ferret in. The little hunter paused for a second, shook itself, and then, with a slow shuffling gait, disappeared into the darkness. A silence fell on our little group. The keeper's well-worn gun barrels gleamed wickedly in the sunshine. Rack, tense and expectant, concentrated every faculty on the place from which he expected Bunny to bolt. From the heart of the wood, a ring dove cooed out smooth love to his mate. Then a scuffle sounded in the burrow, and a light fawn wraith dashed into the open. An ear-splitting crash cut short the love song of the dove, a tiny wisp of blue smoke floated from the right-hand barrel of the gun, and Rack was returning with a little limp body in his mouth. Good dog, said John, patting the dog as he received the rabbit. I turned away. Death was out of place in this quiet sanctuary. A moment later the ferret appeared at the bolt from which the rabbit had raced. He wore an aggrieved expression. Good worker, I asked. The keeper picked him up in the only safe way, thumb and forefinger round the supple neck. Not as good as I have had, said John, and judging by the way he said it, that a reminiscence was not very far away, I waited for him to continue. Best ferret I ever had was a cross between it and a stoat. Easy to handle, I queried. John shook his head with a grim smile. He was cussedness itself, he said, and pointed to a couple of small scars on his fingers. Them's his visiting cards that he left behind. How did you come by him? I asked. Lost a little bitch ferret when we were clearing out a burrow, he explained. We dug for her but couldn't find her nowhere. I came across her about six weeks later, and when her young uns arrived we found they were half stout, half ferret. John glanced at his marked fingers again and said, But they did me a good turn all the same. I looked at him inquiringly, and he went on with his story. There was a fella, a farmer, that was always borrowing my ferrets. Now I don't mind doing a chap a good turn, but he wasn't very particular how he handled them. So when he come up to me one morning and said, Can you lend me a ferret this morning, John? 
I handed him one of the crossbreeds, at the same time telling him to be careful in using it. What happened? I asked. I can't say exactly, answered the keeper slowly, but next morning he handed it back to me without a word of thanks. But I noticed that three of his fingers had bandages on, and on the Saturday his wife took more young chickens and ducklings to market than ever she carried in her mortal life. Had the ferry got out in the night? And I asked. I'm not saying what happened, said John with a smile. I'm only telling you the facts, but he never borrowed any more of my ferrets. John, I said, if a ferret mates up with a stoat, why doesn't a chaffinch link up with a goldfinch or a blackbird with a thrush? Why do the different species of animals keep themselves to themselves? Does the rabbit look at the hare and say, the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans? In other words, said John slowly, why isn't there a general mix-up amongst nature's children? Donkeys with horns on, pigeons with sparrowhawks' talons, pike with the silver scale of a salmon, eh? That's what I mean, I said. You never come across an animal half dog and half cat. Well, said John, to begin with is against nature. Have you ever seen a cage bird that's called a mule, he asked. Half canary and half linnet, I said. Aye, that's it, he answered. There's a bit of compulsion about their mating up, which never happens when they're wild. But, he added, you never found a mule yet that's had a nest of eggs of its own, did you? No, I answered thoughtfully. I don't think I ever did. That's how nature puts a stop to tricks of that kind, said the keeper. Man boys juggling may produce a freak, but that freak has no power to bring into the world a whole succession of freaks. It dies and the race goes on pure. As we ambled our way through the wood, John turned to me and said, Like to see an early nest? He took my answer for granted and led the way to a rocky bank. There on a ledge, dry and secluded, lay the home of a thrush. Mud-lined as usual, I said, and I looked at the four young birds which were packed tight in its comfortable circle. Mud and somewhere else, said the keeper. What's the somewhere else, I asked. What you call saliva and what I call spit, said John, suiting the action to the word. It makes the cheapest and best of linoleums. Wish I knew how to produce it. The youngsters, with no lesson of fear instilled in them, raised themselves and opened capacious mouths. As soon as a parson appears, they're ready to take the collection, you see, said John facetiously. See the yellow line that sets off the outside of their mouths? I do, I answered. It makes an effective colour scheme with the bright scarlet of their throats. That's what it's meant to do, I reckon, said my companion appreciatively. Them yellow stripes are time and labour savers. I looked at him for an interpretation. Well, you see, he explained, the parent birds are kept pretty busy, and most nests are in the shadow of a bush where the light's none too good. So nature provides them with an illuminated sign and the yellow gleams out of the darkness, cried out, You needn't waste time finding the ever-open door, it's lit up for you. Just drop the grub inside the shining line. We watched from a safe distance the coming of the mother bird. She gave a short staccato call. Four snuggling youngsters immediately raised their heads, and a chorus of expectant squeaks proceeded from them. A short flight of the thrush, a moment of consideration as she gazed at her charges, a quick dip of the head into one red gullet, a speedy swallow by the lucky recipient, and she was away again, followed by rallentando disappointed cries of the unfed. As we tramped on, I turned to John and said, What's to prevent the sisters and brothers of one nest mating up together, and so thinning the blood of the race? They have no laws, no tables of affinity warning them against it. If crossbreeding is prevented by nature, what about inbreeding? John considered for a while, then said, Inbreeding, generally speaking, is a bad thing, and nature knows it. For downright grit, hardness and common sense, a good mongrel will often lick a thoroughbred into fits. I agree, I said. There was old Boz that belonged to my grandfather. But I saw that John showed impatience at what he thought might be a long yarn, and my tide of reminiscences ebbed out. 
A truly wonderful thing will happen to them young birds, he continued, as my flow suddenly ceased. Those youngsters will be flying in about three weeks. He looked at me to see whether I was nettled at being choked of my story, but seeing only interested, he patted me on the back with his glance and went on. For a time, the four of them will hang about this plantation, but only for a time. He paused as though he were searching for a word, and then, having found it, he proceeded. Then there will come upon those two little cocks the wandering fever. It's some German contraption, he added apologetically. I know what you mean, I said. You mean the roving impulse, the wanderlust. Aye, that's it, he said. Well, that roving impulse will drive them far afield. It turns them into little adventurers. But the hen birds are stay at homes and will live about their native coverts. And other young cockbirds will, in search of adventure, come to this district and fill their place, I said. That's right, he replied, and that's how nature preserves the race. Humans must have their laws, but the wild has its instinct. As I went home that day, I looked at the birds with new eyes. Everywhere was a vibrant health, alertness and joie de vivre. Everyone seems to chirp, I have the secret. I wondered whether it would not be worthwhile for us humans to ponder more on some of the secrets of their well-being. We seek diligently after health. They live naturally and health finds them. Perhaps it is a much surer way.